Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, good morning everyone and also maybe to our friends in uh, Argentina, good evening. Yeah, so uh, my name is Zainol. Uh, I'm from the School of Chemical and Energy Engineering, Faculty of Engineering University in Technology Malaysia. So uh, today uh, we're going to continue our distinguished lecture series and today we are very grateful and fortunate to have the presence of uh, one of our uh, long-time collaborator uh, all the way from uh, uh, Santa Fe, eh, Argentina. So he is uh, Professor Ulysses Cedron. Uh, maybe um, he's a chemical engineer and maybe a little bit uh, some background of our uh, existing and prior collaborations. Uh, we were involved uh, with some other researchers from UTM in this program, uh, UTM Conicet R&D collaboration. And uh, Prof Ulysses was one of the uh, project leader for, for one of the projects in Argentina. So um, uh, from, from, from there, we uh, already had uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, exchanges of uh, postdoctoral and uh, students uh, to, to both institutions. And we also had, had the opportunity to uh, came out with uh, some publications together. So uh, with that, I think uh, we, we are lo always looking forward to have the involvement of more UGM researchers you know, and more Conicet researchers. Uh, to uh, ensure that the collaboration between the Malaysian, uh, between UTM, especially and the Malaysian universities with uh, Argentinian counterparts, uh, would continue in 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 the in the long future. Yeah. So with that, I think with that brief introduction, uh, allow me to uh, pass the session to our distinguished uh, dean, Yang Bahagia, Professor Dato Dr Rafiq, to proceed with the session. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Zainal. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone to our 114th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Ulysses Cedran from Universidad Nacional del Litoral, Argentina. Okay, a brief about our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Ulysses Cedran graduated as a chemical engineer in 1980 and got his PhD degree at University of Litoral, 1985, Argentina. He was a postdoctoral fellow and became a professor at the University of Western Ontario, Canada from 1989 to 1991. Presently, he is the director of the Institute of Research on Catalysis and Petrochemistry at Santa Fe, Argentina. He is the head of a research group devoted to refining processes, particularly the catalytic cracking of hydrocarbons FCC, the evaluation of commercial catalysts and feedstocks, the environmental impact of processes and products, and the use of non-conventional resources in refining, i.e. waste plastics, biomass, shale, and heavy oils. Since 1987, he is a researcher at CONICET, which is the largest research institution in Argentina, now with the position of superior researcher. He is a full professor at National University of Litoral in the area of chemical reaction engineering. He teaches courses at the graduate and postgraduate levels. He is the advisor of doctorate students and cooperates with companies in the oil refinery and petrochemical areas. So that is the brief biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Ulysses Cedran from Universidad Nacional del Litoral, Argentina, with a lecture entitled Bio Oils Co Processing at Refineries. Professor Ulysses Cedran, over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Rafik, for your kind invitation to be part of this uh, lecture series. It's certainly a pleasure to be with you today. So good morning, everybody down there. It's night for us. It's 10 p.m. in my city, in Santa Fe City. So uh, do I share my screen now? Please uh, let me know how to do that. I'm going to my screen. Excuse me. Is that OK for you? Yep, everything is OK, Prof. Okay, okay. Well, uh, as I was saying, it's a pleasure to be with you. The subject of my lecture is going to be the co-processing of bio-oils 
at the refineries. We will go into detail during the presentation. As you already know, my name is Ulises Cedran. I belong to INCAPE, which is the Institute for Research in Catalysis and Petrochemistry. Actually, today, I would say it's an engineering institute in Santa Fe, Argentina. So, as you surely know, Argentina is very south in South America, no? It's the last part of South America. And uh, our city is a medium-sized city. The red point here is showing it where it is. It's about 500 kilometers north of Buenos Aires, the capital of the country. This is our building, uh, which is uh, uh, something like five years old, close to the river in our city. The institute belongs to CONICET, the National Research Council, and the University of Litoral in Santa Fe. So the subject today is related to the energy situation all over the world. So these uh, photographs, they don't belong to me, of course, they are coming from the International Agency, uh, Energy Agency, where you can find a lot of information about energy and fuels and a lot of deep analysis of the situation. But actually, the situation is of overall concern all over the world. You can see in the newspaper, you can hear it in the TV or the radios, the, the concern by the leaders about the care of our environment, about the huge oil demand we are having every day, the problem of the greenhouse gases emissions, and the problem of the transportation fuels, which define a very complicated situation. You know that, I'm sure. However, this concern is not fully reflected in the oil demand. You can see here that in 2020, as a consequence of the pandemics we are still living, the oil demand had a sharp drop. However, the predictions say that it will recover more or less rapid. For example, the blue line is suggesting the, the actual uh, new oil demand along the years. And even in case a delayed recovery scenario is considered, the, the oil demand will recover. These points are the 2019 levels. However, there is a light of uh, hope here because the gas consumption will still be increasing along the years. The oil consumption, the blue line here, is still increasing. But it is expected that the renewable sources for primary energy will increase very sharp in the near future. However, today we are having a huge oil consumption, 98 million barrels per day, per day are being con consumed all over the world. That's a lot. That's really, really a problem. However, <clears throat> concerning biomass, which is one of the subjects we're going to review today, uh, if you consider, excuse me, if you consider the uh, consumption of solid biomass, liquid biofuels, biogas, or even hydrogen, the situation is the following. This is the actual level of uh, supply. This is the supply expected for 2040 if the stated policies scenario is obeyed. But a better landscape would appear if the sustainable development scenario, mm, this is the key, is applied. And the same is for solid biomass, liquid biofuels, and particular for the case of hydrogen. This is a promising perspective for the next future. So the question for us today is why biomass as an energy source? First of all, because it has been an important source all over the, the, the time, right? But some advantages are quite clear. For example, Vegetal biomass is the only organic carbon sustainable source in our world. The fuels which can be obtained from biomass are the only sustainable liquid fuels. There is usually high availability for biomass. For example, just for, as an example, Latin America could produce about 3.8 million, uh, thousand millions of annual uh, barrels of oil equivalent, which is a lot, certainly. Uh, biomass is typically cheap, usually it's cheap. 
But moreover, you can use residuals from biomass utilization, which is much better, of course. However, some disadvantages are quite clear as well. Usually, there are severe, severe logistics limitations to obtain biomass in a full scale. The information which is available usually is unsafe, is limited. The prices change significantly according to the location, to the demand, the own biomass. And normally, there is a need for preconditioning biomass before use. So these are disadvantages that need to be considered. However, you can see that possible benefits, you can see it easily, are you can obtain chemicals from biomass and in relation to our lecture today, you can get fuels from biomass. Biomass is following cycles in our world. You have biomass growing, you transport that, you collect that to separation processes where you mainly try to find or to obtain food from that biomass. However, all not the biomass can be food. So using that biomass, you can get uh, fuels by means of certain processes. In that case, you can get some energy from that. But once you use the fuels, when, once you consume the fuels, you get a lot of energy there. But these processes are returning back carbon dioxide, water, nutrients to contribute to the growth of biomass. So it's clearly a cycle in nature. If we talk about, about lignocellulosic cellulosic biomass, we can say that it is the cheapest and most abundant biomass source in the world. Usually there are promotions for the economy associated to this type of biomass, and usually it generates opportunities for local jobs, positions everywhere. Uh, we, we, we can consider, in order to produce lignocellulosic biomass, two main routes, two main, main ways. For example, you can use high productivity crops, for example, switch grass. But you can use residues from the economical activity coming, coming from agriculture, forestry, or industry. And that would be a better option, of course, because we are using residuals from that activity. How can you transform lignocellulosic biomass into fuels? Mainly, there are three processes, three options, I would say. The first one is gasification. Uh, this is a very well-known process. You produce syn gas in the gasification. I mean, you produce the mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which is highly reactive. And then you can convert this synthesis gas into fissure straps, hydrocarbons, methanol, other chemicals, and other fuels. The second option is hydrolysis. You obtain sugar monomers from lignocellulosic biomass hydrolysis. And then you can obtain ethanol, gasoline, and other fuels from the sugars and the associated intermediates in the processes. However, today we want to talk about pyrolysis. By means of pyrolysis, you obtain bio-oils. And those bio oils can be converted or upgraded into transportation fuels or co-processed. That's the, 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 the idea for today's talk. So once you have the lignocellulosic biomass, which is composed by cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin in different proportions, of course, if you subject this biomass to pyrolysis, you can get a lot of products. More than 400 compounds are the result of pyrolysis on biomass. Acid and esters, aldehydes, ketones, furans, cyclic ketones, alcohols, sugars are coming from cellulose and hemicellulose. While phenolic ethers and alkylated phenols are coming from lignin after pyrolysis. The process is quite simple. You use a high thermal level, a high temperature, and by means of that, you produce the decomposition of biomass when no oxygen is present. If not, you can get combustion, of course. So after this process, you get gases, liquids, and solid products. The liquid products are particularly composed by a complex mixture of oxygenated compounds. And you can separate two phases. 
from those products. One is the bio oil, which is uh, water soluble fraction. And the other one is tar, a more viscous, heavy fraction, which is water insoluble. Usual, usually we call bio oil to the uh, aqueous phase, but some people call bio oil to the whole liquid phase obtained by pyrolysis of biomass. Biomass are very different, very different, of course. It depends on which one you are selecting. So just as a small example, in this case, there is the composition of pine wood, mesquite wood, which is a tree used for the production of furniture, or wet shell as well. So you can see the difference there. And in our work with biomass, with pyrolysis of biomass, we use a lot of them, always trying to be Recipes from any activity, particularly commercial activities, agriculture. For example, pine wood, mesquite wood, alamo wood, wet shell, soybean shell, many different grasses. Chanyar, which in our country is a very invasive species, that's a problem. And also, we also studied the, uh, the, the, the pyrolysis of waste from palm oil production. This is in cooperation with UTM along a couple of years at least. But we also tried cow manure. This is biomass as well, you know, and many others. The pyrolysis is a process, I would say it's a simple process, which is well proven, which is well established. The biomass is subjected to a high temperature without oxygen. Then you can produce gases, liquids, and solids. And the operation mode will condition the, the, the products. I mean, depending on the temperature, depending on the heating rate and the oxygen concentration, you can get more liquid, more gases, or more solids. That depends on you. But the process itself is quite simple. Uh, in relation to the bio oil, the yields you can obtain of the liquid, char, or gas for phases are very different, again, depending on the raw biomass. This is just a brief and fast example for you all. And the composition, that's really complex. That's very, very complex. You can see a lot of oxygenated compounds. This is a liquid phase eh? uh, with very different chemical functionalities, acid, ester, aldehydes, alcohols, ethers, etc., and also with a very wide distribution of molecular weight. You have a lot of things here. But also the, the physical chemical properties are different. They are usually acidic, as you can see, but I'd like to point out uh, these issues. One of them is the CCR. This is a measure a measure uh, of how much coke the bio oil would produce if co-processed on acidic catalysts. So in this case, you will have more coke. In this case, less coke and much less coke in this case. That's a subject to be considered in co-processing. Uh, the composition is very different, of course. And the other issue I'd like to point out is the effective hydrogen index which is a measure of how easy it is to crack that bio oil. So you can see it changes with the raw biomass, of course. So the idea is let's co-process bio oil at refinery. Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. But the refinery is a very, very complex word. It's like kind of, you can consider this kind of black box where you enter a single raw material, which is crude oil, you have a lot of processes, very complex and interrelated processes inside the refinery, and you get a lot of products from the refinery. Maybe most important ones, but not the only ones, are fuels. So inside the processes in the refinery, those which are cracking processes, that is, are taking uh, loads, hydrocarbon cuts, which have a low value, which have very high molecular weight components inside, which are not useful for other things. But if you crack those molecule, molecules, you can get very useful products. So the cracking products are very important in the refinery. They are central in the refinery. 
Um, I like to point these cracking products, but also thermal processes such as this breaking or coating look as uh, proper to co-process bio-oils. That's the issue of a study. The main idea is that these processes are existing, are consolidated. So you don't have to develop new process to transform these bio-oils. I'd like to talk about our view of the problem. How do, how do we proceed in contributing, contributing to solve this problem? We start from the bio-oil production, the bio-oil thermal preconditioning, because we saw that if you precondition the bio-oil, you may get a lower coke yield in co-processing. But you know, you need to know the bio-oil reactivity on the catalyst you are going to use. And then finally, you need to confirm the process feasibility. So to confirm the bio-oil production, we use a many, uh, many different raw materials, a lot of them. We tried, we studied different pyrolysis conditions. We did a deep characterization of the products. In the thermal conditioning as well, we changed the conditions of the process. We uh, determined what the changes were, and we also determined the product use. Concerning the reactivity, we used not only test reactants representing the various chemical species, but also produce a synthetic bio, bio oil. We, we made the bio oil, but also we use real world bio oils. And then to confirm the process feasibility, we use the bio oil plus BGO. This is the cut you use in cracking processes, uh, commercial catalyst, real world catalyst, and determine the process performance. In order to do that, we use conventional equipment and methods for the first steps, nothing special. For the reactivity, we used commercial catalysts, actual catalysts coming from the refineries. We used commercial conditions to determine that reactivity, and we used fixed bed reactors. Then, to confirm the feasibility of the process, we use again commercial catalysts, commercial conditions, and a singular, a very special laboratory reactor, which we call RISE simulator. The thermal conditioning is uh, interesting to be produced on the bio oil because it will change the, the, the composition, sure, but particularly will decrease the amount of alkylated phenols, phenolic ethers, and ethers, which are assumed to be the coke precursors. So that bio oil will be in better shape to be co-processed. Uh, when you compare the bio oil after and sorry, before and after the treatment, you can see that the potential to form coke has decreased significantly. And the goodness to be cracked, crack has increased significantly as well. So let's talk now a little bit about the FCC process, the cracking process in the refinery. Uh, these pictures are from different refineries, but they have a, a common point to be shared. This is a huge equipment, the one you have in the FCC processes. This is the reactor. This is a long tube, about 25 meters long. This tube is very, very long. And the regenerator, which is this unit or this unit, is about 9 to 10 meters in diameter. So you can imagine these are huge units in the refinery. And the amount of catalyst they use is very important as well. It depends on the size of the unit, but units using 200 tons of catalyst are not uh, difficult to be found in the refineries. So in a simplified way, the riser reactor, the long reactor I was mentioning, is receiving the BGO feedstock, which is typically preheated, and is facing the catalyst coming from the regenerator. So they travel along together along the reactor. Products are separated at the end of the reactor, and the catalyst is sent back to regeneration, re sorry, to produce this cycle of the catalyst around the process. So the idea is to add bio oil to the BGO. And I want to, to point out this issue, the heat balance of the units. This is a crucial, a crucial issue. 
in the FCC unit because the reactions going on here are endothermic and the combustion of the coke here is exothermic. So this heat is transported into the reactor and will maintain the cracking reactions. And this is a very, very delicate heat balance. You need to preserve the balance. So the units are very high, very large, sorry, but in order to show how uh, modifications work, for example, this is a demonstration unit in Brazil, which only uses 200 kilograms per hour. But it, it is still a lot for laboratories, right? So our idea, our, uh, our approach to this is, let's take the riser reactor, this one, 25, 30 meters long, and try to see how we can reproduce this in the lab. Actually, this is impossible because the dimensions I was describing, but the approach is this. Let's take an ideal riser in the refinery and let's take a uh, control volume, a small control volume in the basis of the reactor and put this volume inside a laboratory reactor, a small reactor, where the catalyst is uh, trapped between two porous metal plates and the turbine is rotating a very high speed, so moving gases in this direction and fluidizing the catalyst in the same way which is here. I forgot to say this is a fluidized bed reactor, a diluted fluidized bed transport reactor. So the analogy we establish is this is position zero. Let's say this is time zero. So we're talking about an equivalence between the position at the time evolving in the laboratory. So when the mixture of catalysts and reactants travel along the reactor, that movement would be the same as the time evolution in the laboratory. This travel along the reactor would be equivalent to the uh, time evolution in the laboratory. Anyway, the change in conversion as a function of position or the change of, uh, no conversion, concentration, sorry. The change of concentration as a, time, as a function of position would be equivalent, would be analogous to the change of concentration as a function of time. In both cases, this is due to the chemical reaction taking place. So this is the laboratory reactor. We call it the riser simulator because of the approach I described before. This is the turbine. This is the catalyst basket. And the catalyst is located here, being fluidized by gases circulating in this way. This is the actual reactor. It's quite small. It's only 15 centimeters diameter. This is the impeller. This is the catalyst basket. And this is how we operate it. When everything is ready, when everything is prepared for the experiment, the reactor is isolated from this vacuum chamber. This is a high volume, high temperature, high vacuum chamber, which is now isolated from the reactor. So at this time, you inject the reactant. The reactant, once is facing the catalyst and the, the, the reactor, which is very hot, will vaporize immediately. And after that, the chemical reaction will start. This is a cracking reaction. This is a closed reactor. So the number of moles inside the reactor will increase, pressure will increase up to the moment when you say, okay, I went to the final time, to the final time I wanted to, to have, to reach. In that moment, the, the valve is open, the reactor is connected to this vacuum chamber, high volume, high temperature, and everything in the reactor is removed from it, is evacuated to the vacuum chamber. Then you close the valve again, and you can fit a sampling valve to send samples to a GC analysis. So going back to the bio-oils co-processing approach at the refinery, some considerations are uh, useful and they are common sense. I mentioned the concern about the substitution of fossil fuels for more sustainable sources. Uh, biomass, lignocellulosic biomass, could be used in biorefinery platforms. And bio-oils inside those platforms are a very interesting platform, once again. 
Liquids, you can obtain from the pyrolysis of these biomass after simple technologies can be further upgraded or co-processed in existing units. These bio-oils, I mentioned, include a large number of different oxygenated compounds and important amount of water as well. And you can obtain fuels from bio-oils by co-processing them with usual feedstocks, standard feedstocks in refinery. So you don't need to develop new processes and you can get important savings in capital cost, of course. And the FCC units, the cracking units, which are very versatile, looks uh, look appropriate to co-process bio-oil. So far, results are promising in terms of yields and everything around this. Now, the concept, once again, is you have the biomass, you pyrolyze the biomass, get the bio-oil, you can condition it or not, but you send, finally, the bio-oil, mix it with the vacuum gas oil into the FCC unit to obtain the desired products. These are a brief reference to, our, to some of our experiments in the lab. In this case, we are comparing the VGO or the VGO plus bio oil, or the VGO oil with a pre-treated bio oil. So you see the, the selectivity to hydrocarbons doesn't change too much. Uh, conversion drops a little bit. And the coke is decreasing, even when you add the untreated bio oil. This is an important issue, as I mentioned before, in relation to the heat balance of the units. But, but, Always there is a bad here. There are still many questions to be answered, many. For example, do you expect operative problems if you co-process bio-oils? Are materials in the units a uh, good choices for this bio-oil co-processing? Do not forget they are acid. Uh, how is water in the feedstock impact on the uh, whole process? Are bio-oil coke yields and the nature of the coke, is it appropriate to be co-processed? What are the consequences on the re regenerator temperature and the heat balance of the unit? I insist, the heat balance. And after all, what's the maximum amount of bio-oil you can add to the BGO, to the usual hydrocarbon feedstock to co-process? Is there a limit for that? Yes, certainly, but how much is it? So we decided, instead of showing you now results about our experiments in the lab, I prefer to talk about the simulation of the performance of an FCC unit with different bioid proportions in the feedstock, keeping the total mass of flow, the total mass flow and change. You know, now I'm going to show you some results of the simulation, but that simulation is going to be backed by experimental information. So we did experiments with a bio oil, bio oil BGO experiments. The bio oil is uh, from mesquite sodas. These were the yields. These are the properties of the bio oil, and these are the properties of the BGO uh, feedstock. These are this is a common BGO, a standard BGO. The experiments for the mixtures was, were performed in the rice simulator reactor. This is the temperature of the process, 530. And we use a lot of different bio-oil proportions using different cathodes. So one of the points of interest is the coke yield. So we determine coke yield as a function of the bio-oil content. 5%, 10%, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80% .000 full bio-oil, bio a different catalyst to reactant relationship, cathode relationship. So the lower the cathode, the lower the coke yield. Coke yield decreases as a function of the oil in the mixture. But in the same way, we determine the heat of combustion because that will help in keeping the heat balance of the unit. And in this case, for those experiments, for those cokes, we, de we determine that the heat of combustion decreases as a function of bio oil. And the lower the cut toy, the higher the heat of combustion of the coke. That's a, consequences, that's a consequence of the different compositions of the coke. So most important in the assumptions in the simulation are these for the reactor, these for the regenerator, these are usual. I, I won't stop here. 
I just want to point out that the most important parameters which affect the heat balance of the unit are coke yield, the heat capacity of the cracking products, the heat in value of coke when you burn coke in the regenerator, and the heat of cracking reactions. So in the simulation, we are contributing with this experimental information, the coke yield and the heat in value of coke. Uh, these are the parameters for the simulation. This is how the FCC unit we are trying to simulate operates. These are usual parameters. And this is the experimental information we got. The coke yield as a function of bio oil. These are the yields. And these are the combustion heat. They are here shown in a relative way. So when you only have BGO, we said it is one. And then what's the experimental value for the other mixtures? The definition of the simulation is this. We want to keep the riser temperature, the, the temperature in the reactor constant. In order to do that, you can keep the cat oil constant, the relationship between catalyst and reactant constant, and then you will change the preheating temperature as a function of bio oil content. Or you can keep constant preheating temperature and you can change the cat oil. This is the usual way the units are operated. If you have changes, you will change the circulation of catalyst in the unit. But, but I want to point out this quite clearly. This is not a control move. We are not trying to cancel a perturbation in the operation of the unit or a respond to a change in a set point. But this is a modification strong modification defining a new operative condition in the unit because you are changing significantly the feedstock. So we follow both approaches. Unfortunately, the heat of bio oil cracking is not reported in the literature. You cannot find that in the literature. You can find some information for model compounds. They are slightly endothermic or in, in some cases, they're even ethothermic. Then we assume different scenarios from A to E, assuming that, for example, the heat of bio oil cracking would be the same as pure BGO. Certainly, it will not. Then we assume different values. And finally, we also assume an exothermic uh, heat of bio oil cracking. And these are the results for the first approach, constant catalyst to oil. This is the case for 95% by BGO, 5% by oil. This is quite realistic, no? You know, so uh, when you use different heats of bio oil cracking, you will have different results. And you can see in this case how the temperature, the preheating temperature changes. Not too much in this case. You are using just a little bit by, by oil. So when you co-process by oil, the yield of coke will, coke will be lower and the heating values are lower as well. So you will have a lower amount available of combustion heat and the temperature in the regenerator unit will decrease. Most importantly, the heat that the regenerated catalyst is carrying to the feedstock will decrease when the proportion of bio oil in the mixture increases. And the changes could be not too large in the case of 5% uh, by oil, 5% by oil, only 3 degrees C, the change in the preheating temperature, but can increase, for example, up to 13 degrees C when you uh, have 20% by oil. And that's an important number because when you increase the preheating temperature, you increase your cost, your operation cost. So here we're showing the amount of extra energy you need to add to the system when you increase the concentration of bio oil. And this needs, and this means, sorry, this means money. Uh, even when the feedstock is including 40% oil, in that case, the catalyst coming from the regenerator will not provide the amount of energy you need. You won't be able to have the energy you need to to sustain the operation. Independently of the heat of cracking by oil, you are assuming. And moreover, the BGO should be heated to very high temperatures. And that's a mess because you will have thermal cracking of bio, the BGO, BGO, and you will have coke deposition all over the unit. And that's a very important problem. So 
as a first conclusion for this simulation, you can see clear, important heat balance limitations. The second approach was to keep the const a constant preheating temperature. In order to do that, you will change the cat oil. But if you do that, you will change the yield of coke. So the simulation will tell you what's the cat oil to obtain the yield of coke you need to maintain the same temperature of preheating BGO. However, when you represent the yield of coke as a function of cat oil for different bio oil contents, you will see it's supposed to depend on the heat of bio oil cracking, you assume, but you see it doesn't change a lot. All the situations are in the same line, essentially. And this is the prediction by the model. However, these points are the experimental evidence. So this line, this dot line, is the true yield coke you will have. And this is coming from the simulation. So the intersection of these lines will tell you what the actual cut oil ratio should be. And we are operating a six to seven, something like that. And then you have to go to 10, which is a very high cut oil. And this is only for the case of 5% by oil. When you go to 10% by oil, in that case, you don't have an intersection be between the prediction and the experimental evidence. So this situation couldn't be solved in the refinery. The second conclusion, together with the first one, would show that for the uh, co-processing of bio oil, which, are, which is certainly possible, you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful. You cannot process co-process bio oil and BGO in a blindly way. You have to be very, very careful about that. Anyway, anyway, uh, you can add much more, a lot of more uh, experimental information. But here we are comparing the simulation, which is quite powerful, with the experimental information, and we feel very confident about that. So the message is be careful about this. You can process them, but up to a limit. So that's every, everything I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much for your attention. And certainly, I open to any question or, or doubt you still have. You have my contact uh, information there. I'm open and willing to share with you everything you need. OK, thank you very much for the for the very uh, enlightening talk, Professor Ulysses. Thank you. Uh, so uh, to take questions now, may, uh, maybe if I can ask you to uh, close your PowerPoint, okay. so that we can uh, read out the question if there's any from uh, from our viewers in FB page. Okay. So the organizer, do we have any questions from our viewers? Maybe. <coughs> okay. So uh, while waiting for the questions to uh, appear there. Uh, uh, this very uh, actually uh, uh, insightful uh, session that you uh, show here, bro. Because uh, all this while we 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 think uh, it's not we think we have this idea that uh, bio oil, the introduction of bio oil in uh, heating up some unit operation uh, in uh, factory or something can uh, immediately cover the or reduce the operating costs. You just said now we know that uh, you cannot just uh, add bio oil just like that. You also need to consider, for example, its heat balance limitations, yeah, the amount of energy or the, the need to have some portions of coke left. In, yeah. So uh, in your own uh, experience, Rob, so um, between these two, how do you, how can we uh, look into the introduction of bio oil in a series? I mean, like to be applied how do we go about in doing this? Because we already have these two problems now. Yeah. So far, the experimental information which has been published all over the world is quite promising, I said. So uh, you can expect good results from co-processing bio oils into the refinery. I think, I believe the most uh, proper process is, is FCC. You still have some other processes, but I believe FCC, which is very versatile, is the most proper for this. So before, I mean, no refinery in the world would be willing to add directly 
by oil to its uh, process not directly without having previous information uh, previous analysis of that but I, I try to show you that it is possible to produce that information and particularly if you combine experimental results in the lab and simulation of the units actually this simulation is quite simple it was performed just in our computers but uh, commercial simulations are very powerful tools to which you can add experimental information you know from the lab yeah. and depending in, in the way you get that information you can feel more confident or not about the validity how useful that information from the lab is we feel very confident about that all right bro. means uh, it's very uh, imperative to have uh, a good feasibility studies first yeah before we try to venture into any commercialization efforts so bro, we have one question here by uh, our professor mama afifi he's our ex staff from utm uh, in the light of electric vehicles what will your view be in internal combustion engine maybe in, in the view of application of bio oil bro because now we have the electric vehicles coming up yeah sure you are you can see all over the world that electric vehicle vehicles are uh, becoming more and more important day after day certainly it will be an important uh, option in the near future however when you talk to people in the oil refining industry in the oil industry i would say as you know this is a very powerful economic activity all over the world companies are very very powerful and they have not only economic power but uh, political power as well actually uh, a number of wars have been uh, occurring all over the world because of this <laughs> but you can't stop the uh, the increased number of uh, electrical vehicles when you talk i was saying to oil companies they say that for the next four decades next four decades they will still run, be running the business their business so electrical vehicles will uh, uh, be in, uh, more and more important but it will take a certain time moreover you need to produce electricity to move those vehicles. And that can uh, mean uh, an environment care concern about how you produce that electricity. That's a discussion which is not solved still hmm, for these days. So an interesting option will take a certain time to be completed. And uh, the, the, the issue of how you generate electricity still has to be solved. Of course, you have very good options to do that. Yes. Yeah. So maybe uh, if, we, if we depend on the conventional way of producing electricity, it might not be feasible. Maybe it would be more useful for countries that can produce uh, a lot of uh, solar powered uh, yeah. uh, resources. Yeah. Yeah. Those, sure. uh, yeah. So. Yeah, while waiting for another question, I have one question for you, bro. Uh, you mentioned about the regeneration of catalyst just now, yeah? The, 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 the normal process? The, the yeah. regeneration of catalyst. How many times can we use the catalyst, actually? Because it, it, it 200, 200 tons. Yeah? yeah, yeah. You have 200 tons there, but the particles are very small. These yeah. are 70 microns in the average. Uh, that's the particle size. So the particles are continuously circulating between the different units, no? between the riser reactor and the regenerator. That will be produced. That will produce uh, that the particles will will face a very different environment in the reactor where you have hydrogen, for example, and 500 degrees C. 500, 520 degrees C, and then the particles will go to the regenerator. When you have a much, much higher temperature, 700 degrees C plus steam, plus steam. So okay. the particles we suffer will be severely affected by that conditions. So once they start cycling around the unit, uh, they will be damaged. So every day you need to replace a part of those particles, typically 1%, two tons, two tons a day have to be replaced. Plus, you need cyclones to separate products and the particles. And those cyclones, of course, are not 100% efficient. So you will have a loss there. 
Finally, overall, overall, you need to replace about 1% of the total inventory in the unit, which means a very important amount. So you will have very different ages in the catalyst in the units. Some of them are fresh, some of them are very, very old. In the average, you have the equilibrium catalyst. I see. Okay, uh, maybe uh, because uh, we ha still have like uh, seven to eight minutes left, bro. Maybe one, one last question is from me uh, while waiting for other questions from our viewers. Uh, for your bio oil, bro, do, do you do any fractionation for your bio oil? Maybe just to get some fraction for different applications, maybe? We are, we are trying to separate uh, valuable products from the bio oils. In order to do that, we are trying uh, distillation processes, absorption processes, different different approaches to separate valuable products from the bio oils. I'm not sure if that was your question, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, okay. uh, we, we sometimes we got this uh, request or some feedback from the uh, current yeah. industry players who are working with bio oil and, uh, and this kind of liquids. Uh, yes. They see that this separation of uh, bio oil and its liquids to different fractions are uh, one of the main problem because they want to get different uh, yeah. specific fractions from 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 the whole mixture yeah yes. sure some of the compounds in bio oils can be very valuable but the mixture is so complex that it is very difficult to separate them we are trying to do that but it's very difficult yes oh yeah bro okay um uh if there is uh other questions maybe from the uh, viewers uh no okay so if not i think uh, i shall uh, pass the session back to professor rafi propolisis uh to uh conclude the session over to you prof rafi thank okay. you Zainul, for sharing the session and a very special thank you to our invited speaker professor ulysses sedran all the way from argentina uh, I know that it is very late in the evening in Argentina yeah. right now, yeah? So thank yeah. you so much for spending some of your precious time very late in the evening uh, to give a special talk on bio oils to all our viewers worldwide. So again, thank you so much to you. And then uh, to all our viewers worldwide who is currently watching UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, thank you so much for watching. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Okay, Professor Rafik, it was certainly a pleasure for me to share this moment with you all. Eh? Certainly a pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Good, Good night. morning. Okay.